This morning's lesson is called Victory with God at Our Head, taking our text from 2 Chronicles 13, 1 to 18. With 2 Chronicles 13, 1 to 18, I want to thank Josiah for reading 2 Chronicles 13 and verse 12. That is, uh, this is King Abijah speaking here in 2 Chronicles 13. And as he wraps up his chastisement of King Jeroboam, he wraps it up there with verse 12 as uh, Brother Josiah read for us. As you're turning to 2 Chronicles 13, 1 to 18, I want to tell you this is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, one of the, my favorite accounts. It's not David, it's not Solomon, it's not some prominent figure. You might never even heard of King Abijah, but I hope by the end of this morning, if you don't recognize that name, that you will. He is David's great-grandson. He is the son of King Rehoboam, and he's, he has a very short reign. He's only going to, we're told in the very opening passages of uh, 2 Chronicles 13, that he reigns for only three years. But during that three years, he puts an end to the reign of King Jeroboam. King Jeroboam uh, was the, the rebel, the usurper. Although God did tell him he would establish him a house in Israel if he was faithful as, as David was. And so let's take a look at what was happening here in 2 Chronicles 13, 1-18. For Solomon's sins, in 1 Kings 11, 9-13... King Solomon was told by God through a prophet that God is going to divide the kingdom of Israel. But for the sake of his father David, it would not happen in his days, but it would happen in his son's days. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, was a weak king, and he allowed the rebellion of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, to divide the kingdom as was foretold to King Solomon. There was war between them all their days. We're told that Rehoboam and Jeroboam, there was war between them all of their days. Their reign was not a peaceful one. We find that David was a, a warrior king. He was a king that established peace through war. And that when he handed the kingdom over to Solomon, it, was, it, was, it could be called an empire. It stretched from the northern tip of Egypt all the way to the southern tip of Syria and everything in between. David owned it all. Read 1 Chronicles 18. It is an amazing read of the conquering of God's enemies by David. And that David gives God all the glory and all the credit, and rightly so. So when David dies and hands this empire to Solomon, it is very peaceful. Solomon doesn't have to go to war like his father. Solomon spends his time building. He's known as the, the wise and builder king. But upon his death, his son is a weak king. He listened to the wrong people by his own choice. And because of that, the kingdom is ripped in two, just as God had foretold. More than, and it's not, it's not an equal two parts. Jeroboam gets northern ten tribes of Israel, while then the one area becomes known, the southern kingdom is pretty much known as Judah. Simeon is somewhere in there, but it's mostly known as the kingdom of Judah. And so they, it is not a peaceful reign. Rehoboam inherits a, king, a kingdom that is, that is of peace. He allows it to be ripped asunder, and there's war between him and King Jeroboam all the days of their lives. In 2 Chronicles 13, 1 to 22, when Rehoboam died, King Abijah, his son, we're told that he had a confrontation with Jeroboam, and he's going to remind him why the kingdom was divided, and he's going to put the root cause and the reason squarely in the lap of King Jeroboam. And then he's going to draw a contrast between the northern ten tribes of Israel's kingdom and the kingdom of Judah. And the prevailing two themes of this encounter, or King Abijah's speech, is that rebellion to God is a losing endeavor, and he says victory is only found when God is at the head of his people. But the people have to give him the head and let him lead. That's his point. So people need to learn that lesson still today, that victory only comes with God at our head. So let's go ahead and get into our reading this morning. We're going to begin reading in verse 5 of 2 Chronicles 13. And we're going to talk about the sins of Jeroboam. One of the first things that's pointed out is rebellion. Rebellion is what Abijah reminds him of. So one of his sins is rebellion, 2 Chronicles 13, 5 to 8. <clears throat> so here's King Abijah. This is the beginning part of his speech 
to all the people assembled there. He says, Do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his master. And worthless men gathered about him, scoundrels who proved too strong for Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when he was young and timid and could not hold his own against them. So now you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord through the sons of David, being a great multitude and having with you the golden calves which Jeroboam made for gods for you. We can read that in, at this encounter, if you were to go back into the beginning of uh, chapter 13 and verse 3, it tells us that Abijah had 400,000 chosen men, while Jeroboam had 800,000. So Abijah is outnumbered two to one. But the point is, there's over a million people of Israel here, both of the tribes of Judah and the northern ten tribes. And notice what he says Yet Jeroboam, that's their leader, that's their king, the servant of Solomon, who is the son of David. He is just really hammering in who Jeroboam is in relation to the covenant made between God and David. He rose up and rebelled against his master. That would be Solomon. And worthless men gathered about him, scoundrels. Too strong for Rehoboam. That's his father. He's talking about my father was a weak king when he was young. He was timid and he couldn't stand against Jeroboam and those worthless men. And so now the kingdom has been torn asunder. Abijah wants to try to reconcile that and bring them back under the control of the sons of David. The first thing Abijah reminds Israel of is its unrightful leader's rebellion against his master. He reminds them Jeroboam was a servant of Solomon there in verse 5, that the rightful king comes from the line of David. That was Solomon. And then it was Rehoboam. And now it's Abijah. Abijah is that rightful king. Jeroboam rebelled and Israel with him against God's anointed, God's elect. This goes back to 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 26 that tells us Jeroboam was the son of or the servant of Solomon and he rebelled against him. But it is important to note God gave the northern ten tribes of Israel to Jeroboam. And it began with his rebellion against Solomon. And God told him, when God had him anointed king, God told him to obey God. And God says, I will establish your house like David's over Judah, yours in Israel. This goes back to 1 Kings 11, 26 through 39. And God is pretty clear that if you do not... I will remove you as king. God says, I will make a covenant with you if you are faithful to me like David. I will establish your house forever. So Jeroboam had the potential to start a dynasty the way David did. With God's approval, with God's covenant. But Jeroboam rebelled against Judah and he rebelled against God through idolatry. He was not faithful to God. So after we make each point, I want to make an application. How many people still do this today and rebel against God? They rebel against Jesus, God's son. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It's like 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. All things are put in subjection, even his enemies, it says of Jesus. And yet there are people still today who want to do it their own way and either flat out reject him, rebel against him, or say they, they serve Jesus, but he's not really their head. They're the head. And they put Jesus somewhere over here as modeled, or modeled in their own image. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9 answers the question, who are the enemies from 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 28? Who are the enemies who will be put in subjection under his feet? Paul answers that in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. When he returns, it will be retribution. That is vengeance, justice against those who do not know God and those who rebel and do not obey the gospel. Even those who profess to be Christians can rebel against God in doing things the way they want to 
and not in God's way. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, when he says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, we did all these marvelous things in your name. And his answer to them is, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness or iniquity. We need to be careful that we are not numbered among those who rebel against God. Further looking into the sins of Jeroboam, Abijah is going to call him out for his faith and strength of numbers. In 2 Chronicles chapter 13, 3 and verse 8. In 3 it says, Abijah began the battle with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 chosen men, while Jeroboam drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 chosen men who were valiant warriors. So all things looking somewhat equal, while the numbers are two to one in Jeroboam's favor, it does say that these, the men that they have with them are chosen men, and they are valiant warriors. So they're not, they're not surrounded by weak soldiers. These are valiant men. These are men that are willing to go to war and die for their king. And Abijah's case, even under overwhelming odds, but then in verse 8, he says, So now you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord through the sons of David, being a great multitude, and having with you the golden calves which Jeroboam made for gods for you. And we'll talk about his idolatry in a second. But first, he says, You have a great multitude. There's no doubt about that. You brought a great multitude, and you think that is going to be your victory. That is how you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord. Jeroboam's army outnumbered Abijah's two to one. Jeroboam trusted in his great multitude, as Abijah points out. But Abijah doesn't seem concerned with the numbers. You've got to ask yourself why. Remember when, when Jesus was talking about the cost of discipleship, he uses the, the image of a king going to war against another king. And he says that king needs to make sure that he, his numbers going against another king with greater numbers, they, they can do it and not having after engaged in battle then have to sue for peace. Jesus is talking about counting the cost. Has Abijah counted the cost? Abijah doesn't seem concerned with Jeroboam's great multitude, does he? Because he understands that with God, strength and numbers don't count. Maybe he's remembering Judges 7, 1 to 25, as I did as I was putting this together, with the account of Gideon. God called Gideon out of hiding, called him a valiant man of, of war through an angel, and told him that he was the one that was going to deliver Israel from a foe that was innumerable. That means you couldn't count them if you wanted to. And he tells Gideon, you go do that. And so Gideon gathers an army and God narrows it down to 300 men and says, go do that with that many. And Gideon took the 300 men, and the point was, they didn't have to fight that innumerable foe. God routed them when Gideon gave the war cry. When, God, when Gideon raised the war cry, and they did what he said to do, and they created the loud noise and all the lights, and the army down below thought they were surrounded, it says God routed them. They were running over each other trying to get out of that valley. And all Israel had to do was go and plunder the spoils. Maybe Abijah was thinking about Gideon. Or maybe he was thinking of Psalm 118, 8 to 9, that says, It's better to put your trust in the Lord than in men. Abijah's telling everybody assembled there whose trust Jeroboam put, or who, who Jeroboam put his trust in his great numbers and his false gods. The application is that God decimated great armies who came against those who put their trust in him. One, just thinking of who Abijah is, he's the great-grandson of David. David went out and had to, to face face-to-face -face combat with the champion of Gath, who was a giant who frightened and terrified the army, the standing army of King Saul for 40 days. And David said, Why is everyone running from this guy? Let me take care of this. And David sauntered onto the field wearing no armor, bearing no sword, but a staff, a sling, and five smooth stones. And he tells the giant, 
By the end of this, I will cut off your head. And you and the giants and the Philistines and everyone else there could have been wondering, with what blade and with what army? He's the runt of his father's litter. But David knew the battle's not won by sword, by spear, or even his sling. It was by God. We can look in 2 Kings 6, 12 to 23. A great Syrian army surrounds the city of Dothan to get Elisha. And Elisha's servant tells Elisha, we got to get out of here. And Elisha prays to God, open his eyes. And when his servant opens his eyes, he sees the host of God surrounding that big multitude surrounding Dothan. God was bigger than the great multitude. In 2 Chronicles 20, 1 to 30, King Jehoshaphat and all Judah were besieged by an uncountable host. Very reminiscent of when Gideon was around. An uncountable host. And it's when Jehoshaphat and all Judah gave the war cry, God won the battle for them. 2 Chronicles 32, 7 to 8, King Sennacherib of Assyria came against Jerusalem, besieged Jerusalem. And he says in his own words, in his own journal, the journal of Sennacherib, he caged up King Hezekiah like a bird. And one angel from God wiped out his army of 285,000 overnight. And the king went home in disgrace and a little later on was assassinated by his own sons. God does not win by spear, by sword, or great multitudes. God wins by those who put their trust in him. Many people think they're right because they're in the majority. And I can only imagine Jeroboam being puffed up, thinking, I, I outnumber you. And Abijah saying, none of that matters. You're in sin and it needs to change. But so many people today think that when they're in the majority, it must mean that they're right. Being in the majority has never been the right test of what is right. And it's never been the right test of what is an obstacle before God. And the application to us is that many churches put their faith in their large numbers. And that somehow that means they're doing what's right. The large numbers doesn't mean that they're doing what's right. Sometimes the large numbers are there because they're hearing what they want to hear. We need to be careful that we're not just here because we want to hear what we want to hear. Further looking at the sins of Jeroboam, he's serving false gods. In 2 Chronicles 13 and verse 8, he says, So now you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord through the sons of David, being a great multitude, and having with you the golden calves which Jeroboam made for gods for you. <clears throat> Jeroboam had made two golden calves, 1 Kings 12, 28 to 29. He placed one in Bethel, the southern boundary of his territory, and in Dan, the northern boundary of his territory. And his point was, you don't need to go to Jerusalem annually for those annual feasts that the law of Moses called for. You only have to go if you're in the north or in the middle. You just go to Dan or go down to Bethel. Don't cross the border from Bethel into Judea. There's no need for it. And the people went with him in this sin. Abijah makes the claim they not only trust in their strength of numbers, but they rely on their golden calves, their false gods, and thus they're committing idolatry. Is Jeroboam keeping the command of God to be faithful unto him to have a house established like David's? No, he is in the wrong, thus proving himself to be the king that is in rebellion. He's in rebellion to the sons of David, he's in rebellion to Judah, and he's in rebellion to God. As we make application of that, 2 Kings 19, 14 to 20. Hezekiah, in his prayer before God, when he was besieged and caged up like a bird by King Sennacherib, he said, of course Sennacherib destroyed the gods of other lands because they were the work of men's hands and were not gods. And he prays to the true and living God. And as we pointed out, God sends that one angel, one, wipes out Sennacherib's great multitude. 285,000 men that were besieging Jerusalem, and he was sent home in disgrace. In Romans 1, 22 to 25, we're told, the foolish worship the created rather than the creator. Colossians 3, 5 and 1 John 5, 21 tells us that we need to be careful to guard our hearts against greed and other desires. It tells us greed can become like idolatry. 
It can become those things that we are covetous of will become our God. 1 John 5.21 says, Guard your hearts from idolatry. Philippians 3, 18 and 19. Paul says there are those whose gods become their desires because they fail to make God first in their lives. And when they do that, they follow, it says, after their appetites. That is their desires. Paul says they make themselves enemies of the cross of Christ. Make themselves enemies of the cross of Christ. It was the cross on the cross of Christ that Jesus shed his blood for the sins of the world. That any of those who want to make him their head and be obedient to him can have their sins forgiven and have the hope of eternal life. But instead, their God becomes their appetite and they make themselves his enemy. <clears throat> but Abijah is not done. In numbering the sins of Jeroboam, he next says they have false priests, which follows if they have false gods, they might have false priests. This goes to 2 Chronicles 13 and verse 9. Here he says, <clears throat> Have you not driven out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands? Whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams, even he may become a priest of what are no gods. Jeroboam set up his religion of the golden calves where priesthood could be bought. You might remember, God made the tribe of Levi his special people who would serve in the special function as priests. Now, apparently there were other tribes who, and other people who felt that was too exclusive and were jealous because as soon as Jeroboam did this, he made the two golden calves and he changed the feast days and even changed the feasts. Gave them different parties to go to and said, you don't go, need to go to Jerusalem annually. Just go to Bethel, go to Dan. And he said, the priesthood of Levi? That's too exclusive for my religion. We're going to open it up to everybody. Anyone can pay to become a priest. So the priesthood could be bought. And here we're told that the Levites were driven out of the land. Where did they go? Judah. They ran south to Judah because they were being persecuted. But Abijah sets him straight as to who the rightful priests of the Lord are. Not anybody with money or rams or bulls that can buy it. It's the Levites. They were the only tribe that God made that special covenant with. They were the only ones out of whom could serve in the tabernacle, later the temple under Solomon. They were the only ones, that, and, and not even just Levites, but only a specific exclusive Levite from the family of the Kohathites was allowed to minister to the Ark of the Covenant. But here Jeroboam just says, oh, anybody can take care of the golden calves. So he accuses Jeroboam of running the Lord's priests out of the country, making his worship like that of the lands around them. And he points out that his priests are priests of no real gods. I love that part. <laughs> they buy the priesthood of what are not real gods. What he's saying is Jeroboam appointed unqualified men to be his nation's spiritual leaders. And so no wonder the country was in trouble. But doesn't this sound familiar as we make application? It happens today with most religions. Men called pastors who are preachers. And most times when they're called that, it's a preacher of a false doctrine or false teaching. Pastors, as we find out in Acts 20, verse 17 and verse 28, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 2, pastors are elders. And yet in today's world, anyone who pays their way through seminary at the end is called pastor or reverend. So in a sense, people are still paying for a title of what is not a real doctrine. A lot of people are still doing what Jeroboam's priest did. They bought their title. What about the, the knock on your door and you answer it and there's young 18-year-olds wearing a title on their, their shirt saying elder. Even churches of Christ who appoint unqualified men to be elders just for the sake of having elders are in the wrong. 
appointing unqualified men to be spiritual leaders. There's a danger there. We need to be remindful of that. There are those today who call themselves Christians, but yet they haven't taken the steps to be a Christian God's way. A good heart and a prayer, baptized as an infant, those are not qualifications that make one a Christian. And yet there are those who say, I'm a Christian. When were you baptized? How were you baptized? Oh, I said a prayer. doesn't cut it. Acts 22, verse 16 Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus and told him, Why do you delay? Arise, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. There's going to be a lot of people who think they serve God. Lord, Lord, didn't we do these marvelous, wonderful things in your name? They're going to say, Lord, Lord, that, that Hebrew intimate phrase, for we know you. And he's going to say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, we read there's one body, one faith, one baptism. Not many, certainly not the thousands that are out there today professing to be Christians. But they do it their own way. Christ really isn't at their head, somewhere off to the side or even maybe behind in a lot of these cases. The point is being religious doesn't make one right. You must do it God's way. Jeroboam and his 800,000 valiant men of war here, they might have looked religious. They would have had the trappings of the priesthood with them. But as Abijah points out, they were priests of no real gods. If you don't do it God's way, none of it matters. So then as we contrast the sins of Jeroboam, I want to contrast it with the faithful obedience of King Abijah. Abijah is going to point out that they serve the true God. 2 Chronicles 13 and verse 10 he says, so after he points out those four things that Jeroboam has done wrong, he says, but as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And then notice, and we'll get to this a little later on, and the sons of Aaron are ministering to the Lord as priests, and the Levites attend to their work. He is pointing out, we serve a true God. We serve the living God. We have not forsaken him. He's saying, the 800,000 of you and your king, you have forsaken him. You're following after the golden calves that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, set up. But not us. Over here in Judah, we're serving the true God. Abijah points out several times throughout this speech that he and all Judah serve the true God, the God of their fathers. And he reminds them who is in charge. It is God. And I'm reminded of a couple passages I just want to share with you. In Hosea 11.9, God says, I am God and not man. In, J in Isaiah 43, 10 to 13 and verse 15, there in that passage, God reminds his people that he is God and there is none other besides him. He says, I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no other. Then he reminds them that I am your king. I am a great king. But they wanted to look like other nations. Remember 1 Samuel 8 and verse 5, when they called for a king in the first place, their entire argument was, we want to be like the nations around us. Remember what Abijah said of Jeroboam? With their priests of any tribe, any payment they could make, they could become priests. He says, you look like the people in all the other lands. They got their wish, didn't they? They got the king to be like all the other lands, and they even, in the case of the northern ten tribes, even got to have priests that look like all the other lands around them. The application is very short, but an important one. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, we are to love God with everything we are, our heart, our strength, our mind, and our soul. That doesn't leave room for any secret part of us that we want to keep just for us. If we give God everything that we are, we're not going to be committing idolatry. We're not going to be serving false gods. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Saying to rely on the one, the true God, the creator and righteous judge. That's what Colossians 1, 16 and 2 Timothy 4, 8 call him. Abijah also says, 
that Judah was not only doing it right by serving the true God, but they had true priests. That same passage in verse 10 of 2 Chronicles 13. He says, And the sons of Aaron are ministering to the Lord as priests, and the Levites attend to their work. He points out Judah still has the rightful priests of the Lord. The rightful priests of the Lord were from the line of Aaron. They were Levites, and their job was to minister to the nation. Their job was to serve in the tabernacle slash the temple. Their job was the sacrifices and to oversee the three feasts that everyone had to pilgrimage, make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. Contrast this statement with his statement of Jeroboam's unqualified servants, his unqualified spiritual leaders in the land. An application to, make, to be made is from 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. I was thinking of this passage where Peter quotes an Old Testament passage and applies it to Christians where he says, Christians are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. We are Christians, saints, those who have been baptized into the waters of baptism, rising up, a new child of God. Their sins washed away. They become saints. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. Mark 16, 16 tells us the right way to become God's servant. To believe in Him and be baptized into His name will be saved. Those who do not believe, they will be condemned. Saints are priests of God. Saints are the qualified servants of the Lord today. And we are told, just as the priests of old, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we're to be separate and to do things God's way, not look like the world around us. He says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. <coughs> Abijah further states, not only were they serving the true God, they had true priests. The true priests were performing true service in 2 Chronicles 13, verse 11. He says, every morning and evening, they burned to the Lord burnt offerings and fragrant incense, the showbread is set on the clean table. The golden lampstand with its lamps is ready to light every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. And that is strong language, isn't it? King Abijah is just letting Jeroboam have it. And he's saying this in, the, in front of his 400,000 men, Jeroboam's 800,000 men. So they all hear that they're doing it wrong. Or in the case of Abijah's 400,000 men, they're doing it right. He says every morning and evening, they're burning to the Lord burnt offerings. They're offering the fragrant incense. He says the showbread is on the table. The lampstand is ready to light every evening. This was the duty of the priests whose turn it was at the tabernacle and then later the temple. Their job was to go in and light the, that menorah or that lampstand every morning and every evening. He's saying that duty, as light and as little as it might seem, is still being performed day by day by the true priests. He says true service to God is taking place. Is the way we serve God important? Abijah knew it was, and here he's pointing it out. Here he finds it important to tell Israel the rightful priests are worshiping God the rightful way. And what he's saying is their worship to God defined who they were in contrast to the priests of the northern ten tribes. And in his speech, he lists their proper details of service to God, rightful king on the throne, rightful priests, rightful way of worship, right faith in the one true God. Now, we can make application out of this as well. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not our own, not make up our own, not keep the doctrines of men, but keep Jesus' commandments. We're told to serve God the right way. When qualified men are selected, the leadership over the Lord's church is to be elders with deacons serving under them. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Timothy 3.1-13, and Titus 1.5-16. And Colossians 3.17 gives us this warning. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through Him to God the Father. As we go about our daily life, our daily service to God, everything we do must be under His authority. If we're about to do something and we cannot do it in Jesus' name, don't. Don't do it. 
You'll be outside his authority. That's who he said marked them as walking in lawlessness there in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Galatians 1.10, Paul contrasted serving to please men with serving to please God. He said, if I wanted to please men, I wouldn't be wearing these chains. Whatever it cost, he was going to be pleasing to God. Matthew 7, 21, 1 John 2, 17, both Jesus and later his apostle John said, the one who does the will of God will live forever. There is a right way and there is a wrong way to serving God. And the wrong way is not service at all. God will not look at that as service. So the way we serve God matters. Abijah recognized that. And finally, he points out, in contrast to Jeroboam's sins, that not only was Judah serving the true God with true priests, performing true service, that they were exhibiting true faith. This was the scripture reading we had this morning from Brother Josiah, and ask that you read it again with me. Now behold, God is with us at our head, and his priests with the signal trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you will not succeed. Was Abijah concerned about their great multitude? Not at all. Because he knew the lessons from the past. He knew those lessons. God is at our head. Do not fight against the Lord your God. You will not succeed. God set up the nation of Israel with the intent that he would be their head. He would be their king. And because of their grumbling during the days of Samuel, he relented and let them have physical kings, going back to 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7. Oh, they had physical kings, but God told them over and over and over again, he was their king. And the physical king over them was supposed to be his servant. You can go back to 1 Kings chapter 11, 26 to 39. He told Jeroboam, you will reign over the northern ten tribes, but you will be my servant. If you want to be successful, you want a house established like I did for David, you be faithful unto me. And Abijah is pointing out over and over and over again Jeroboam's failings in that. Abijah tells them, Judah's doing it right. God is with us at our head. Many kings forgot that. And their power allowed them to become corrupted. True faith in God gave Abijah the courage to rebuke this errant king of Israel and try to bring his brothers back to God. But he was letting them know he would not compromise with them. He said, you have forsaken him. God is at our head. When we make application, if only more Christians realize that Christ is our head, not a preacher, not an elder, not a deacon, not any man. God is our head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, and Ephesians 5, 23. It's so important that he says it twice in that letter to the Ephesians. God, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Colossians 1, 18, Christ is the head of the church and is over all things. Reminds us again of Jesus' own words in Matthew 28 and verse 18. 1 John 5, 4 through 5 says, Our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Abijah's faith here was about to win a victory. Revelation 2, 10, True faith, the faith we have until death, is a saving faith, and that God will reward such faith with the crown of life. God will save his people when they show true faith in him. The point is, victory only comes to those who have truly placed God at their head. Though he was outnumbered, King Abijah and his men trusted in the Lord. We can read, if you further read all the way down through verse 18 and even down to verse 22, you find out that while he's talking, Jeroboam is setting an ambush. And when the ambush is sprung, it took place, it says that Abijah and his men were attacked from the front and the rear. They did not scatter. They stood their ground and they cried out to the Lord, further exhibiting the faith that Abijah said they have. And when they cried out, and in 2 Chronicles 13, 13 to 18, tell us, it was after, not only did they raise their cry up to God, but then they raised the war cry. So these men outnumbered two to one, standing together when the ambush is sprung, they're surrounded on all sides. 
they raised the war cry. And it's when they raised the war cry and they went to war, God took over from there. Just in all those other examples we talked about before. It was after they cried out to him and acted on it. They didn't just pray and wait. They took action. They charged into those overwhelming forces, demonstrating their true faith in God. And it was when they took a stand, when they took action, that God saved. And the victory was won that day for King Abijah, thus showing what faith in God can do no matter what your numbers look like. This is a lesson so many people need still today. This account shows us the futility of resisting the kingdom of God. This account shows us the power of obedience to his will when we live with God at our head. Abijah warned Israel, do not fight against the Lord your God. He says, you will not be successful because God saves his people. He says, do not rebel against him and resist the kingdom of God. And that's the message still today. Don't rebel against Jesus. Don't resist his kingdom, that is the church, but be found obedient to his word. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10 says, When Christ comes again, retribution will be dealt out to those who do not know God and to those who have never obeyed the gospel. My admonition and encouragement for you this morning, if you're here, not a Christian, you need to become one to be obedient to the gospel, to live your life with God at your head, and you will win the eternal victory. And this morning, if we can help you in this in any way, to become a Christian, because if you are here as not a Christian, you are in rebellion to God. You are resisting his kingdom, and you are subject to his judgment. You need to repent and be baptized. Become a qualified servant by obeying him in his way, to hear the gospel, Believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as your Lord, be baptized, and live a faithful life unto him. And this morning, if you're a Christian not living the life that you should be living, now's the time to make it right. Now's the time to recognize where correction needs to be made and make it. And if we can assist you in anything today, this morning, the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now while together we stand and sing.